Ellis, thank you so much. Uh, and I really want to uh, acknowledge uh, Professor Von Braun and Professor Bauman for inviting me to this very important meeting. And I'm looking forward to vigorous discussion in addition to what I'm sure will be very interesting presentations. Uh, I'm, my, my title is going to talk a little bit about the cancer moonshot, but then in addition to expand the area beyond the moonshot itself. Uh, <clears throat> this slide really talks about the similarities between the cancer moonshot and the Europe's feeding cancer plan, which I'm sure we will be hearing more about. To me, there are similar goals, reducing cancer mortality and reducing disparities. And for the cancer moonshot, it places these two goals front and center. And as has, has already been said, for example, by more than one speaker, no one nation, no one person can solve cancer alone. And we need to consider very seriously constructively and practically how to work together best. And one message that I want to convey uh, as a follow-on to what Dr. Vitapas said is to help support research and cancer control in low and middle income countries in addition to the European Union, the United States, and other high income countries. I'm going to talk about tobacco control because it is so important as a critical cause, not just about 30% or so of cancer, but also of serious cardiovascular disease, as well as pulmonary disease, many different conditions that lead to premature serious disease and death. And then talk about cancer disparities beyond the high income countries Cervical cancer will be the example that I use. Uh, and then health disparities and technology, because I think that this is a potential great opportunity, but one that I think has been neglected. So let's focus for a moment on the cancer moonshot. President Biden a year ago announced the reigniting of the cancer moonshot, what we re to refer to frequently as Cancer Moonshot 2.0 uh, at the National Cancer Institute. We are still in 1.0, and you could argue that shows you how backwards we are. But uh, we have one more year of funding for 1.0, and we are making a lot of investment in research uh, and some progress in that area. And I'll allude to some of that. But in the, in the second quote, the goal is to cut cancer death rate in half in the next 25 years and to end cancer as we know it. Uh, last year, I asked some colleagues at the National Cancer Institute to look at the feasibility of this aspirational goal to decrease cancer death rates by 50% uh, in the next 25 years. And my colleagues have just submitted the uh, the manuscript looking at their findings. And anybody who would like to have a copy, it's still under review at the journal, please ask me during the break. In addition, if you are interested in my slides, just ask me. I'm happy to provide them for you. But the third uh, quotation, to address iniquities, we can target prevention, detection, and treatment efforts so that all Americans have equal access to cancer diagnostics, therapeutics, and clinical trials. That's something that we all can aspire to. Uh, I now want to talk with a few slides about tobacco, its importance, and not just the question of the disease that it causes, but the opportunities for reducing disease. This, uh, th this slide shows you on the left uh, some selected countries that are high income countries where what has happened over the last 20 years with tobacco control. 
high income countries the average is in red shows that there has been substantial decrease but still a lot of room for improvement but if you look at individual countries there is a considerable heterogeneity at the top Croatia actually their tobacco consumption has gone up over the last 20 years France has remained more or less steady despite the recent increases in the cost of cigarettes in France and then we have the United States and the United Kingdom where there are the decreases if you turn your attention to the right side of this graph in the pink is what has happened on average with the low income countries again a decrease and also the middle income countries in purple again a decrease but we have some countries where there's just starting out in 2000 with enormous rates of tobacco consumption and there are notable exceptions of Indonesia and China the most populous Muslim country in the world and one of the two most populous countries in the world where their incidence or consumption of tobacco has not changed appreciably according to the data in the last 20 years if we now look at what's happening in the United States I'm showing you these data to emphasize that although there are substantial racial and ethnic disparities for health including cancer in the United States the decrease in tobacco consumption actually has been quite similar from one race or ethnicity to the other and this decline is associated with reduced risk for cancer and for other diseases this slide is taken from a publication by the NCI extramural cisnet modeling group published three years ago which shows the projected impact especially between 2020 and 2040 a 20 year interval that Dr. Mitopas referred to where the projections are that there will be a 50% decrease in lung cancer in the United States during that 20 year interval and that is exclusively because of decreases in tobacco consumption as some of you may be aware we published a paper three years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine that showed in addition to the ability to decrease the incidence of lung cancer substantial advances in the treatment of lung cancer also are having a major impact on reducing its mortality rate and that 2020 paper did not actually include the important advance subsequently with immune checkpoint inhibitors they had been approved but there had not yet been time to look at their impact I'd now like to turn our attention to the area of cervical cancer and again if you look on the left what I have shown you is the disparities in the United States Hispanic black and white women between 2000 and 2019 note that white women have the lowest incidence of cervical cancer in the United States and if you look to the to the right their mortality rate also is the lowest when you start in 2000 you see that Hispanic and black women had an incidence almost twice as high as that of white of white women and that has come down to some degree but especially when you look at the mortality rates they're close to 50% higher but if you look now on the left on the bottom in the blue rectangle is shown the incidence and mortality for cervical cancer in North America the blue is the incidence the red is the mortality rate and now if you look above in the red rectangle it shows the incidence and mortality in Africa and what I want you to appreciate is number one the blue is much bigger number two the red is much bigger 
but also the ratio of blue to red is much lower, if you will, than in a high income country such as the United States. In Cardinal Turkson's uh, home country of Ghana, cervical cancer has an incidence that is about twice as high as the incidence in the European Union and the United States. But what is really shocking is the mortality rate is more than five times higher in Ghana from cervical cancer compared to the uh, mortality rates in the United States and the European Union. So I just think that we should be thinking about conducting research in low and middle income countries in addition to doing research in our home countries. The NCI conducts research on HPV vaccination and cervical cancer screening in low and middle income countries as well as other things. And, and they are moonshot uh, 1.0 research activities. And if this research is successful, it could be applied for intervention that can be applied in low and middle income uh, countries. It's very important if you're doing research there to guard against exploitation of the affected population. For example, studying an intervention that is too expensive for the country to actually implement. My colleague at the National Cancer Institute, Mark Schiffman, uh, is, uh, has a moonshot activity where I think for the first time it's going to be feasible to do high quality see and treat cervical cancer screening. And it's really using technology and changing from cytology to HPV based uh, testing. And then an on site automated visual evaluation uh, of the cervix with a smartphone and an artificial intelligence uh, algorithm, and then on-site thermal uh, ablation. In uh, Cardinal Turkson's home country of Ghana, only 3% of women actually get cervical cancer screening. If this screening, and uh, Mark and his colleagues are studying 100,000 women to validate this approach, if it is validated and recommended by the WHO, my hope would be that Ghana and many other low and middle income countries will be able to embrace this and be able to save tens of thousands of women's lives. <clears throat> uh, I, also, to increase worldwide uptake of cervical cancer, uh, of HPV vaccine uptake, only about 10% of adolescent girls are vaccinated in low and middle income countries. But, uh, so the NCI is developing more evidence that one dose of the vaccine can induce long-term protection. The WHO Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization last year recommended either one or two doses for nine to 20-year-old women. In the United States, worldwide uh, HPV vaccination could save more than $300 million uh, annually. And uh, this is my disclosure at the bottom. I am an inventor of the technology underlying the uh, vaccine. And then for my last point, we must be intentional when we think about technology development. Technology can decrease disparities, increase disparities, or be neutral. But don't wait until the end to consider the possible impact of a new technology on disparities. To increase the likelihood of a technological development decreasing disparities, think about the disparities from the beginning of the process. And even more direct, develop technology whose goal includes reducing disparities. My uh, colleague at NCI, John Schiller, is trying to take advantage of certain kinds of uh, immunity that people have against viral uh, infections and use that to harness it for uh, immunotherapy for people with cancer. And the goal here is really to develop an off-the-shelf technology that will be inexpensive enough that it could be used in low and middle income countries. Will it be successful? I have no idea. But if you don't try it, it will definitely not be successful. So the take home messages really are number one, Consider addressing health disparities in low and middle income countries in addition to disparities in the United States and European Union. 
make it easier worldwide to adopt healthy lifestyles, prevention, and screening, develop even stronger worldwide efforts to reduce tobacco consumption, conduct research in low and middle income countries on diseases that are common there, and consider the implications for health disparities when developing new technology. In summary, the African proverb says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Thank you very much.